It's the final day. It's 24 hours left for the 50% off sale of MAP suspension and MAP performance. They're both half off right now, which is why I'm going to give one of you lucky viewers both those programs for free. That's right. Free, free, free. So one of you guys will get those for free. Here's how you can enter. Leave a comment in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Make it a good comment. Subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. If we like your comment as the best comment, we'll notify you and you'll get those two programs for free. Now, everybody else, those programs are 50% off right now, but the sale ends in 24 hours from when we drop this episode. If you're interested, head over to mapsfitnessproducts.com. Just use the code SEPTEMBER50 for that discount. All right, here comes the show. You know, when we were, you know, all of us kind of, you know, were the coming of age with our workouts right around the same time. I mean, I started as a, as a, as a teenager. <laughs> that was like a nice way to say we're old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, we're you know, more youthful. Really, it was like, it was the 90s, right? Early 2000s when we were really, you know, starting to get into working out and, and the exercise that everybody, you know, competed with or over or bragged about was bench press, right? Everything oh, was yeah. about how I much mean, can you bench? The golden standard was always bench press. Yeah. I mean, it's still kind of that way, isn't it? A little bit. I think people now have more of an understanding of other lifts and how important they are. Yeah, you know, nobody would have bragged about their squat or deadlift. That's you know, fair. That's fair. Yeah. I definitely And CrossFit definitely brought that to the, the masses as like a thing to talk about, yeah. right? Like people talk about their pulling weight and their squatting yeah. weight, which they didn't before. Now, the, 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 and now, this episode is not about the bench press, but I bring up the bench press because for a long time, it's been kind of, you know, people talk about it as this test of upper body strength, like how, how strong your upper body is. And they'll use the bench press as a metric, but it, the reality is there's an exercise that is far superior way of measuring your overall upper oh, body strength. Agreed, fully agree. And uh, it's the overhead press. Uh, you know, how much you can lift overhead means so much more about your, well, just overall strength, but upper body strength in particular than almost any other exercise I can think about. And I'm talking about the standard, you know, standing well, It's just so much press. more relatable to everyday life and, and functional um, activities that you're going to face. Um, uh, not a lot of times are you going to be horizontal uh, uh, pressing somebody off of you and, uh, and being real stable and you know that's right that. and uh, again that that produces a lot of benefit for sure with the bench press but in terms of like functional strength and uh, phone calls and like answering um, <laughs> you know you <laughs> got to make sure your your shoulders are bulletproof yeah you know what's funny too is uh, I, I figured this out later on as a kid I, I started to get into kind of the history of resistance training and I would read about the old time strongman. And I remember learning that the bench press was actually an exercise that nobody did back in the day. It was added uh, much later on. In fact, when back in the day, I'm talking about like late 1800s, early 1900s, 1910, 1920s, when you know some of these lifters were performing these incredible feats of strength. This is, of course, before anabolic steroids, before even supplements. If they wanted to bench press, what they used to have to do is there would be a bench. They'd have to clean away, lay down, and then press it. It wasn't until later on where they invented the bench press with the arms where you could sit the bar on it and then do a bench press. So what exercise did they often compete with each other over? It was always the overhead press, always. That was the exercise where if you had, and this used to happen all the time back in those days, you would have strong men uh, competing with each other or challenging each other. You know, you could look up some of the challenges Eugene Sandow would have with other strong men where they would get these huge crowds and the way that they would compete was almost always like, how much can I lift overhead? Yep. Well, you wouldn't you say it's the squat of the upper body? Oh, totally. Yep. And, totally. and I think that there's a lot of limiting factors for people too for that. And a lot of people want to just discount doing the squat. Like you don't have to do the squat and I'm sure you don't have to do the, the overhead press. But I think part of what makes it so special is because of that, because of how challenging it is. I think because we're so rounded forward, the ability to do a full overhead extent, you know, extended overhead press uh, is challenging for most people. Most people can't do it with with good form. Yet it's so important that we we have this ability to do that. For Justin's point of you know all just daily function, dude, totally. Um, and again, when you go back in time, people instinctively knew that. It's funny when I talk to my dad. So my family's always been my dad's side has always been into into strength. This is kind of how I get introduced to it. Nobody lifted weights. My grandfather in Sicily, I don't think ever saw a dumbbell, especially not his father. But they would, when they would go to work, they would always, you know, just to make work more lively, 
compete and see who could be the strongest. And it was always what you could lift overhead. And so there's like a little bit of wisdom to that. And one of the things that I noticed is if you have any weak links in your entire body, yeah, it's going to expose immediately. You know, you could have, you have lower body instability. You can't do a good overhead press. You have a weak core. Good luck with an overhead press. Yeah. And of course the shoulders, arms, you know, thoracic spine, it's all there, your body full extended. And it's probably why the oldest and most studied and, you know, form of strength competitive sport, Olympic lifting, involves a lot of overhead pressing in their lifts. Think of all the exercises that they do, uh, you know, what they compete with, the snatch, the clean and press. I mean, it's all, a lot of them in involve extending arms overhead mm -hmm. and how much weight you could lift overhead. They don't do anything like a, a bench press you, or e even a squat. Do you right? think it's more or less neglected than the squat? A overhead press? Yeah. Probably a proper overhead press? That's a yeah, good yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, no. A full overhead press, barbell overhead standing. press. At least like standing. the same amount. I'll, I'll even give say. you seating, but seated, but like, I can't have the, the short 90-degree military press that you see all the time. I, I would think that it actually is as much or more neglected than the squat. That's is. a good point. Yeah, I think you're right. Especially today, because you bring up you brought up the point about, you know, CrossFit. Since CrossFit, I feel like you go into a gym now and it's actually rare I don't see someone squatting. Before, like when we talked about when we all first started, yeah. uh, the dust that would be on the squat rack, you would see one person maybe a week that actually used the squat rack, where, you know, 10 years later, CrossFit comes along. Now it's rare that I go in a gym and I don't see somebody, at least one person squatting or deadlifting. That's very common. But I have to say that it's still very common that I'll go in a gym and not see a single person barbell overhead press. Yeah. yeah I mean, I do point. cringe worthy. Like I have to give them a bit of credit for bringing back squats and overhead press. Those were two you know, main lifts that you didn't see a lot of people doing with full extension and the ass to grass kind of component to squats too. They're popular, popularizing that. Um, but yeah, I think uh, those two specifically have so much to give. And I, I like the comparison of, you know, the overhead press being like a squat because there's just so many different uh, parts involved that have to work perfectly in order to perform it correctly. And then you get that benefit to it. Otherwise, um, you could be practicing this with bad form and getting no benefit. In fact, you know, hurting yourself. Yeah. So it's, you know, so you'll get some pushback of uh, other coaches out there, I'm sure within, you know, not going to full extension and just focusing on the squeeze and, you know, not really articulating your shoulders all the way through. And, you know, you'll get chiropractors out there don't want you to go full rotation with your shoulder because it's for some reason it's bad for you. Um, and so there's lots of uh, crazy information out there to get through, but, uh, if you're doing it right and you're you're focusing on the, each one of those components that make up the overhead press, it's going to totally trump any other exercise yeah, out there. You know, one of the big mistakes I think that is made with overhead presses is that people consider it solely a shoulder exercise. And here's why that's a mistake. Because yes, it is a shoulder exercise. The, the shoulders are involved. And of course, the triceps are involved. But a good overhead press, standing overhead press, uses a large amount of your upper mid-back muscles. There's a lot of core stability and posterior chain stability that is involved. In fact, they're involved heavily in stability. I remember reading an article uh, by Jay Cutler. So Jay Cutler was Mr. Olympia, I don't know, five or six times, right? He was a obviously impressive physique, very big bodybuilder. And I remember him writing about incorporating... This is, this is after he turned pro. So typically bodybuilders will do... You know, and this is generalized, but typically we'll do these really big foundational movements early in their career. Later on, as they get really big, really bulky, massive muscles, they start to move away from these movements and more towards machine work, more towards shorter ranges of motion. Part of that probably has to do with the fact of their just overall mass and, and you know the way that they move. But I remember Jay Cutler saying in this article that he started doing overhead presses standing. Not only did his shoulders develop more, but he said he noticed his upper mid-back. That's what he was known for. Was his started shoulders. to really develop really well. And this was a big deal because Jay Cutler, you know, a little bodybuilding history, right? Would second place to Ronnie Coleman all the time. And where Jay, Jay Cutler would lose was the back. Ronnie Coleman had this back that still to this day is unmatched. And Jay Cutler in this article was like, one of the biggest improvements I saw from standing overhead presses was my upper mid-back development. You have to have incredible stability to do that. So doing a good standing overhead press, being strong in it, and then, you know, being able to press your body weight overhead 
means a lot. Like if I see someone in the gym overhead pressing their body weight, that is extremely impressive to me and yeah. with good form and stability. It's mm -hmm. extremely impressive. You know, speaking of bodybuilding, I know we're going off this little bit of a tangent, but you just reminded me of something that I haven't thought about in a long time is, is it Ronnie Coleman was six foot tall, right? I believe he was. Yeah, Ronnie Coleman was. So comparing those two is kind of like the Arnold and Colombo time because uh, Cutler short. It's like what five nine. He's like he's as what he was. I mean, I'll never forget the first time that I ran into him in Vegas, and I'm walking right by. I wish I would have taken a picture of him when I was walking behind him. It looks weird how wide he is. Yes, right? he's as wide as he is tall. <laughs> he looks like a, like a big square when he's when he's oh he's so Col Coleman's five eleven, which is very tall for bodybuilding. Yes, standard, yeah. Right? So when you, I mean when you put those guys next to each other and the the back that Coleman had, it just was yeah five nine. Yeah. So and, and I think that's even actually an exaggeration. Like when I these guys, I think sometimes exaggerate on how <laughs> yeah. tall they are when they're sh when they're shorter you exaggerate how tall you are oh, yeah. of course but yeah, yeah it was crazy he was known though for his shoulders his delts were insane they man. were and yeah five five nine i think is the average height uh for for pro bodybuilders but yeah i i read that article and i was like whoa i didn't realize how big of a difference and i i personally did overhead presses as a kid stopped doing them later on reincorporated them in my i'd say mid-20s and saw the best, some of the best upper body development I'd ever seen. And it improved my bench press. It improved my tricep exercises. I noticed just benefits all the way around. I didn't do them forever because uh, it, they hurt my low back because I did them terrible. I, I remember uh, when I would press, I couldn't get full extension and I would, I would be looking at the bar when I would press. And so I had this massive, excessive arch in my low back while I did it, which is what I see a lot of times when people try and do it. You don't see like a mm -hmm. good full extension. I, in fact, I don't think it was until I started working out with Justin did I start incorporating that exercise into my routine. So I don't remember what year you and I got linked up and when we first started training, but back in like 05, 06. But before that, even as a trainer, it was a movement that I completely neglected, primarily because I sucked at it, just like squatting. Squatting yeah. and overhead pressing, I, which is probably why I'm so passionate about those two movements, is I was in the camp of not doing it for a long time. Mm -hmm. For a long time, I was like, ah, don't do it very well. There's lots of other exercises I can do to develop my legs. There's lots of other exercises I can do to develop my shoulders. But the, the effort to work towards getting a good overhead press like the squat ended up being one of the most beneficial things I ever did. I mean, not only just from a development point of view, but also from my performance. Like you talk about the bench press, like my bench never got past 225 until my overhead press yeah. really started to accelerate. Once I started yeah. to get the strength up in that, I saw a huge difference in my incline and my flat bench. It just, it just, it will reveal all kinds of weak links. Like you think you're strong, you think you're stable, Try doing an overhead press with your body weight, and if you're weak anywhere in that chain, it'll reveal itself very, very quickly. Much like in your the case, squat. it was yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, much like the squat. That's why I think those those two are so similar. That I mean, from literally your your feet all the way up, totally you, is being incorporated. And if there's a breakdown anywhere, you'll you won't be strong in that movement. Totally. Now, I think the first component to being able to overhead press your body weight is kind of the first component to getting better at any exercise, which is to practice it often. Yeah. There, whenever you're looking at a, a especially a high skill exercise, now all exercises require a level of skill. So there's technique and skill, understanding how to control the weight, the, how the muscles fire, what it's supposed to feel like when you get into the groove of the lift, all that stuff. The more skill that's required for a lift, the more you're gonna benefit from frequent practice. Mm -hmm. And a standing overhead press is up there with one of the more one of the exercises that requires more skill than not. Now it's not as skillful as I say an Olympic lift, but it's definitely more skillful than most other shoulder exercises or upper body exercises. And so what off what practicing often does, and we'll get to, we'll talk about the muscle building effects and all that stuff, but what practicing often does is you learn the movement. Your muscles learn how to communicate properly. And that allows you to get stronger and stronger and stronger at the lift because skill is a very important component when it comes to strength. Yeah, and, and with this sort of mentality, um, you know, lowering the weight substantially is going to be a big factor to that. So that way you can just really hone in on the technique and see where all the deviations are occurring in, in terms of feeling your way through it. Uh, one thing that I take a lot of clients through uh, when we're really kind of trying to work and sharpen our, our overhead press is to be able to add more tension and, and utilizing that grip 
uh, to, you know, to really enhance, uh, you know, your muscles response as you're going through that movement, the more tension you can provide, the more stability, your signal, uh, you're providing, uh, your body that everything is accounted for. And, uh, it, it tends to move it, it through that a lot more smoothly. Well, speaking of practice and grip, one of the things I do remember about lifting with Justin and starting to practice the overhead press was the the way I grabbed the bar. So one of the things, if you fall in the category like me where you train more like a bodybuilder or you never did full range, you kind of grab, when you do a shoulder press, you grab this real wide yeah. 90 degree in your elbows shoulder press movement where when I started training with Justin, my elbows yeah, were much tuck, narrow. tucked in by my side, so I could bring the bar all the way down to my all the way down to my chest without me having to arch. Like if I'm here and I come down to my chest, I've got to arch my low back to get it down yeah, to that position. Yeah. Versus if my elbows are tucked in by my side, I can sit upright. Like that was a major game changer for how I did the shoulder press, and that came from practicing and learning where the proper hand position was for me, my stance, things like that. That that all comes together with that constant practice of the movement. Yeah, the first time I, I was able to overhead press my body weight, uh, I was overhead pressing in some way, shape, or form about four or five days a week. So literally four or five days a week, I would go to the bar and I would practice <clears throat> some form of an overhead press. Now, some of those were heavy. Some of them were lighter. Some of them were fast or slow or one arm. But the, the bottom line was I practiced overhead pressing often and that allowed me to get really good at the skill over overhead pressing. It got me really good at knowing how to brace my core properly, how to stand properly. And then, and then what ends up happening, and this is a, a really cool feeling. If you ever do an exercise frequently and you do it right, you'll notice that you could call upon your CNS uh, mm -hmm. quickly. Like I could generate a good amount of force right away. It didn't feel like I was unstable or like I had more strength left, but for some reason I couldn't push it out. It was like I honed that signal and my strength went up so fast. And this is for any exercise. It, it'll go up so fast with frequent practice. And again, if you look at strength athletes, athletes that compete and the objective way of winning is not being on stage and looking good, but rather how much you can lift, they practice their key lifts often. I don't care if it's strongman, power lifters, or Olympic lifters. Off, often practice is important and studies support this now. Yeah, so 100%. a couple things uh, that bodybuilding does really well is uh, really connects you to your, your mind-muscle sort of connection there uh, and, and has you feel feel that response and feel your muscles getting involved, uh, where performance really shines is, uh, really addressing sort of like that weak link in the, the overall movement. And so we can sort of break it down as where that, that weak link is. A lot of times it's in the overhead position and the full lockout position. Yeah. Uh, and so that's something too, as I went through practicing, like I noticed that, uh, I was a bit weak and unstable, which then affected my core. You feel lower back sort of talking to you at that point. Uh, so obviously bracing the core and getting the core involved is a huge part of that, but also just, uh, being able to, to recognize that overhead position and, and be strong in that overhead position, uh, was a massive game changer for me. Yeah. Overhead carries. That is a, that's one of the best ways. And I'd never, I didn't incorporate that until I was in my late thirties where I would well, do wasn't it. Wasn't it with Justin? Wasn't it was. It, the same thing for me. I, I, you know why you don't see that in like a, a 24 hour fitness. You'll never see, no. I, or at least I have never seen that. And, I have never seen somebody put kettlebells or a bar, anything over their head and then walk across. And carry the gym. It. Yeah. That's, I've, it was so foreign to me and it wasn't until not only you and I got linked together, but it was after you and I, you went your separate ways. You were in a private gym and it was the, you know, going into like a private setting like that. And then you were the one that got me to do that. Up until that point, I don't think I'd ever even seen anyone do one before. No. And yeah. you know why? Part of it is it's not, it's not ever promoted as like a, a muscle developer or a, Such a, or great a body shape. Such a great movement. Yeah. But it is. It's a tremendous one. I got great shoulder development and upper back development uh, from doing it. But what it re but the, the reason why I did it, and that was a side effect, by the way. I didn't do it to develop my shoulders, although I saw that happen. It was to make me really stable at the top. And Justin's 100% right. Most people are unstable with an overhead press if they're unstable anywhere at the very top. That's when the lever is the longest. That's when the weight is the furthest from your feet, which are grounded in the floor, and you're off by a little bit. 
it's like holding a broom by the very end versus by the very middle. It feels very heavy because of the leverage. Your arms are fully extended. You're off a little bit. Mm -hmm. If you're off an inch and the weight's down on your chest, it's not mm -hmm. that big of it. You're off an inch and the weight's overhead. Yeah, it can get away from you real quick. Very quickly. So walking with heavy weight overhead, uh, and when I say heavy, it's all relative. You, you need to have perfect form. So you, you, what you do is you extend a weight overhead. I love kettlebells for this. Over your head, real tall, real stable, brace your core, and then you walk real good in a straight line, keeping everything braced. Slow and controlled. Yes. And th and that, that's what, what I love about this. You talked about earlier about how, you know, if there's any breakdown in the kinetic chain, like you're going to be weak. That's your, why you walk. And that's, yeah. yeah when So when you do these overhead carries, you're, and I love to do it if you can, if you're in a gym that'll allow you to be barefoot and take your shoes off so you can like feel the grass as you mm -hmm. walk. So I can feel my feet gripping on the floor. I can feel my core tightening up and staying stabilized and holding the shoulders above there. And that's all you're thinking about as you're walking, keeping that like perfect posture through the entire movement. Uh, the carry over to that into the shoulder press was insane. What a difference that was by incorporating that. Huge. Another mm -hmm. movement uh, that I never did until later on uh, was, was the favorite. Z press. Yep. It, and I never did it. I, now I'd seen a Z press before I'd seen it in magazines and you know, here and there, it wasn't a popular exercise, but when I saw it, I thought, what's the benefit of that? Just sit on a bench. It doesn't make any sense. You're sitting on the floor. Why don't you just sit on the bench? I didn't realize the stability that was required in order to do a Z press because your legs are out in front of you. Mm -hmm. You have to brace your core, sit real tall. You're not nearly as stable as if you're sitting on a bench or, or even a physio ball. It's very different from even a physio ball. You have to stabilize even your lower body in an interesting way. If you have tight hamstrings, forget about it. And then it slows you the hell down. And and that full extension really has to come through yeah. at the top of a Z press. Otherwise, you're going to fall back on your back. What a great exercise for uh, overhead press strength. It's the ultimate test, I think, uh, You know, for if you're bracing properly, if you have that core connection, if you have that stability, it's going to completely expose uh, you know, any instability. And that's why I love it so much. And it's just, you don't realize how much you compensate with your legs. And when you're doing a lot of these like uh, total body movements or compound lifts, um, I think uh, sometimes we get carried away with the momentum of them just trying to get to the end position, uh, not really paying attention to all the moving parts involved. And, and this is one of those that's just like, okay, if you don't have proper stability, this is going to totally destroy you. I, I'm so mad that I did not find this movement until yes. way later in my career. In fact, we were pretty much done personal training. I mean, I had a, maybe a few clients at this time. Um, this, I would have actually never taught the overhead press without first teaching the Z press. 100%. So if I were to go back and do it all over again, I would never teach a client. Okay, so for all my trainers, I would never teach my client an overhead press first. I would teach a Z press first and get them good at that and the reason why as a trainer you're always looking for like these trainer hacks to like get like you know i've done a one of the viral videos i did on youtube was the split stance bicep curl right and that that doesn't you know develop the biceps any better it was a trainer hack to keep clients in good posture while they did a bicep curl mm -hmm. and it was it was magnificent it was so simple and yet it like corrected so much of my clients bad form when doing curls the Z press is that for the shoulder press. How can I, as a trainer, there's so many things that they have to think about when they press. How do I cue them so they have this perfect posture all the way up the kinetic chain while they're doing this press? The Z press forces them to do that because you'll fall over if you don't. Mm -hmm. it, and you you have to stabilize at the top so you get that part of it. Your core has to be tightened up or you'll you'll fold and fall over. It, it just forces them into perfect form. And if you master the Z press, then getting them into a standing press, seated press, push press, all the other shoulder movements, you, you'll you see a huge difference in form and technique. Well, one of the hardest things to learn with an overhead press is that bringing the head forward and getting that full extension, where they say coming yeah. through the window. Yeah, pull the head, through, head the through the window. You have to do that with the Z press. Yes. In fact, here's the challenge. If you're watching and listening to this and you think you're strong and you do, but you never do overhead presses, but you do lots of shoulder exercises, get on the floor in a Z press position and do no weight. Yep. Hold, hold just a barbell or a broomstick and see how it feels to get a full straight line. What I mean by full straight line is it's not just overhead, but if someone looks at you sideways, the stick, your shoulders, and your hips on the floor are perfectly aligned. And I bet you a good 30, 30 to 50% of the people watching this wouldn't be able to do it. They'd be like, oh my God, I can't 
get in that position. In fact, Adam, that's a, I would have loved it with my clients, yeah. and that's what I would have done. Yeah. I would have done no weight. Can yeah. you do this with no weight? Let's get in that position, learn that, and then we'll add a little it's bit of weight. It's the perfect prerequisite yeah. for teaching somebody how to do an overhead press yeah. is, yep. to, is to get it. It also changed the way I do all my shoulder press movements on other exercises. So, for example, because you have to – fully extend, the core has to be tight, and then you you kind of have to stay. You'll, the first time you do this, if you haven't done it before, you, the very first time you press, you'll feel this, whoa, yeah. you know, because everything is having to be tightened up, and if it's at all slightly off, it'll be off balance at the top because you don't have that ground to, or your feet to comp, help compensate for that, for that movement. So doing this is a, a, a movement that I think everybody should do to start off before you get into your shoulder pressing. And what it did for me was I noticed that I had to stabilize the top. And then I noticed this like amazing pump I got in my shoulders from stabilizing at the top. Yes. Mm -hmm. So now even when I do single arm presses, normal barbell presses, push presses, I actually I stabilize at the top for a couple seconds before I bring down. You which can the, connect better. Yes. Yeah. And in the past, I used to, you know, you just you just press up and then as soon as you get to the top, you're coming right back down. Instead, now when I press, I stabilize, perfect, then come back down. Press, stabilize, then come back down. And that came from learning how to Z press because you had to do yeah. that on the Z press or you'd fall over. And it's now carried over into all my other pressing movements. Well, before we jump into the the push press, which I know we're kind of going out of order here, but like I wanted to bring up the bottoms up press being uh, another way to really identify any instability in terms of lateral forces, rotational forces, something that's going to take you out of alignment uh, in your press. And so what a bottoms up press is with a kettlebell. So basically you flip it upside down uh, and you're holding the handle of it. Yeah. Uh, so challenging. So it's just like... And a lot of times with the overhead press, you're going to see a lot of broken wrists. So mm -hmm. like you're, the wrists are going to be down in this position, which is not going to be ideal. Uh, and so this really helps to address that as well in terms of keeping a nice tight wrist and fist. Uh, and it, it, the challenge itself of just holding it in an isometric position alone uh, you know, is something to, to work on. And so if that's, a, that, that's a challenge for you, I'd probably start there and then start with like some walks, just like you would an overhead, uh, press walk or overhead carry. Uh, and then from there you want to literally take it as slow as possible as it's moving on you. You have to keep and maintain that stability and then into full lockout position mm -hmm. and then back down. It's, insanely challenging but you're working on so many different stabilizing contributing muscles uh that we just don't yeah. highlight enough yeah it's it, it, when you're holding because when you hold the kettlebell by the handle right the weight now the most of the weight of the kettlebell is at the top not at the bottom so you've lengthened the lever and the part that you're holding is lighter <coughs> than the part that the the most of the weight that you're moving so what this forces you to do is to keep your elbow and wrist directly under the weight, which by the way, this technique and skill is extremely important when you're doing any heavy overhead pressing, because if my elbow is in front of the weight or behind the weight, I'm losing strength. I'm losing force. The biomechanics now are not ideal. So it forces you to keep everything straight because if you move out just a little bit, that kettlebell is flipping. On you. It's going to flip over and land right on your forearm. So it forces you to, and I, the, the first time I learned this, believe it or not, was when my dad embarrassed me in my studio. And I say that tongue in cheek. My dad is just, he's got this incredible natural strength. Yeah, he's I'll a beast. I'll never forget. He came into my studio and he's at this time, he's probably 58 or something like that. And he's got, you know, I've, I've talked about this before. He's got arthritis everywhere. He's been working, you know, hard labor since he was a kid. And he comes in, we're going to have breakfast next door. I got two of my trainers working, a couple guys. And my dad comes in and he picks up one of the heavy kettlebells and he's like, hey, how much does this weigh? And I knew my, I know my dad. I'm like, oh, he's going to lift the heavy kettlebell to see how strong he is. And he flipped it upside down. I'd never taught him an over, uh, you know, bottoms up. He flipped a 70 pound kettlebell upside down and pressed it overhead. Now I can press 70 Dang. pounds overhead. I could not for the life of me, even balance a 70 pound kettlebell. Yeah, bro. Try a 30 yeah, or 25 and, pounds. And I remember thinking to myself like, and it's my dad is very stable and he's got really good technique to press overhead. And that's the first time I realized that just the, the stability and strength required. Because again, I grab a 30 pounder 
and it was extremely challenging. That was the first time I was like, oh, this is this is a big deal. This is very challenging. So this comes up, and I, you know, we've actually never talked about this together. So I'm curious to what you guys think. This is actually a, a movement that I like to do for priming the shoulders before I do a, like a like hardcore shoulder extra mm -hmm. workout. That or like W's, and, I, and, and you know, mm -hmm. it's the rotator cuff and stabilizer muscles that get in, involved that I think is so valuable. Yeah. One of the most common things I, I would see with clients that would, would have hard time shoulder pressing is like pain. And a lot of that is because the the, the shoulder isn't floating in like the, the proper position and it's a lot, it's sliding left or right or front or back. There's and a then looming it's, impingement there. Yeah, and then you're getting impingement and then that's what's limiting them from actually doing this where to what Justin was saying, you know, that movement, it wakes up all those stabilizer muscles so well so it puts you in a more optimal position when you go to do it and this is for bench pressing too so i i yeah, like to do yeah. this stuff with both w's and the bottoms up press before any pressing movement so whether i'm doing i'm going to go heavy bench that day or heavy overhead press i love to use the the suspension trainer do some w's do a couple bottom bottoms up presses and then get into whatever my heavy movement is i feel like it just wakes up all those stabilizer muscles and puts myself in this solid stable position before i go to press a lot of awesome. weight. Mm -hmm. Now the next movement I think a lot of people are familiar with, but most people don't do this right. It's an extremely valuable upper body power movement and it's the push press. Now the first time I was exposed to a push press was reading Arnold Schwarzenegger's Encyclopedia Encyclopedia Cyclopedia Bodybuilding. And in there, Bertel Fox, who was a, a bodybuilder that he used to show all the shoulder gamer. exercises, <laughs> talked about doing over, you know, push presses as being this great mass builder. Now, the way I did them when I was younger was wrong. A push press when I was younger just meant cheating with an overhead press. And I really wasn't gaining much benefit other than I could lift a little more weight because I would jerk the weight up. Mm -hmm. Later on, I realized the value of a push press is being able to generate speed on the bar. So you could definitely push press your max weight, but you're not going to gain the, the best benefit by doing that. The best benefit, in my experience, from a push press is using a weight that you could overhead press strict and now try to generate speed and then gain stability at the top. So the idea is at the bottom, can I explode into the press? And then at the top, can I stabilize, mm -hmm. bring it back down? You're treating it like a power movement. This translates into, it's almost like giving you more torque with your lift, right? If you look at the, like a car's performance, there's torque and there's horsepower, right? Horsepower requires that the engine revs up a little bit before it generates its power. Torque is right now. Mm -hmm. Right now you got that power. So when you when you strengthen your body properly with a good push press and you build that power, and then when you go to your strict overhead press, rather than needing the bar to move a little bit before you can generate all that strength, you call upon it right away. So that's the right way, in my experience, to it's do push press. completely different stimulus. Yes. It, you know, like the grinding strength is, is very valuable and being able to kind of work your way through that. But... Uh, to be able to get that lightning bolt response and to be able to generate that amount of force on command, uh, you know, gives your muscles a completely different stimulus that then they react to. And then you're going to notice too how that forms and shapes your muscles to even like gain more size and strength. Now, this does fall under the, the category explosiveness or like plyometric type of work where it's definitely I, closer to that. Yeah. I, so this is, uh, this is not something I teach until I feel like my client client has got really good form in the overhead press. Yeah, you better be able to do it perfectly slow before you try going fast. Right, right. Yeah. So the exercises, this isn't in any particular order because there's other ones we're going to do. I definitely think that this is kind of the peak, right? Like yeah. I can't think of anything else that I would I would make after this. This would be the kind of the pinnacle of, you know, building this incredible overhead press. This is like, okay, you've done such a good job with stability mm -hmm. and control and strength. Now let's see how well you express that by, by loading this sucker up and then and doing it in explosive. I also love when you do this back to the point I was making earlier about the stabilizing at the top, man. If you if you can't get that weight up by strict pressing and you have a weight that you can explosively get up over your head and then you stabilize over there, it kind of reminds me of like, I'll never forget the first time my buddy, and I've talked about this on the show a long time ago, when they wanted me to feel what, you know, uh, three plates felt. Actually, I think it was two plates. It was way before I could even do that uh, on a squat. And they just wanted me to feel that that kind of weight. That's how I feel like when I would get to a place where I was over, or I was doing the explosive presses with weight that I knew I couldn't strict press yet. And then the having to stabilize at the top, the development that I got of holding that much weight that I wouldn't be able to slowly press up over my head 
to get it up there, I saw huge benefits from yeah, that. Yeah, and again, it's you want to use weight. You can move uh, relatively quickly, so it's typically a little lighter. Um, and stop at the top. You don't want to do a push press where you throw the weight up and bring it right back down. Uh, that's not a great way to do. You want to explode up, hold at the top, stable, then bring it back down. And you you shouldn't do these to fatigue. If you do them to fatigue, now you're turning an explosive movement into just a regular lifting movement. So you want to do these explosively. So let's say I do a, a push press with 135. Okay, let's say I put 135 pounds on the bar. And let's say if I really wanted to, I could probably get 12 reps out. I'm stopping at five in, in th or six. And it's five or six explosive reps. Then I put the bar down, I rest, and then I repeat. That's where I get the that's how I get that explosive benefit out of that exercise. Now you're talking, you know, you're talking about a lighter weight doing this. I was talking, I was talking about doing a heavier weight. Justin, what's your opinion on on training it like that? Because I think there's value to both of these. I think there's yep. value to, and there's actually an order for sure. You definitely should have a light weight that you can control with good speed first. Yeah. But I also think there's there's tremendous value in be able being able to use your lower body to help push up a weight that you wouldn't be able to get yeah. up straight. Yeah, either. and I think that comes after really focusing on stabilizing that overhead position, lockout position. If you have you want to enhance that further, that's a way to get up a lot of weight. So now we can really start, you know, progressively overloading that top position. Uh, so there's a lot of value in that. And I do that personally uh, to challenge myself in that direction. Uh, but also the speed part uh, is with lightweight. And so I think that's, that's a misconception a lot with power training is – um, there's speed training and then there's also like, you know, uh, strength speed, I guess you would yeah. call it. So, um, you know, those two are, are, are somewhat different, but, um, uh, provide, you know, uh, their own unique, uh, well, that's know, a great, that, no, it's a great example. And if you're, if I'm talking to an advanced lifter, who's got a good press, the, the, these are two different forms of adaptation, right? You either the way that Sal's talking about where it is purely a speed thing where you would actually do a lighter weight than what you would even be able to strict press. And then there's the opposite where you're going for like the explosive strength where you would do something that's much heavier mm -hmm. that you wouldn't be able to get up in a street press. Both are different adaptations and both could be a way to change both, up your Both shoulder. utilizations of the push press. Yes. Definitely. And then now the next one would be your loaded rotational exercises. I know you're big on this, Justin. Yeah. What are some of your favorite, I guess, movements Well, on this? yeah, so um, this I actually found my way here because I would just hit a wall all the time, um, especially with bench press or overhead press where – my shoulder just would inevitably sort of get off track. Um, and I would start to feel this impingement forming. Um, and it was just because of the repetitive stress just in that one direction. And so uh, finding my way towards, you know, rotational movements, um, you know, there, obviously there's a prerequisite to this. And this is what we kind of highlight in our prime programs in terms of like regaining that ability to rotate and have that kind of range of motion again uh, in your shoulder first and having connection to that. Uh, so, uh, in terms of like loading that though, that's something I think a lot of people don't even realize you can do like, that's, you know, a, a part of, of, you know, progressive overload, you can add into your programming, um, that I, I got turned on to by, uh, old methods with, uh, Indian clubs and with the mace bell training. And so you've seen examples of this, you know, popularized by, uh, you know, some of these like kettlebell groups that kind of came and then, um, you know, like on it and some other uh, companies have kind of highlighted uh, some of these old methods and their value. And so I was in on that whole um, uh, quest to, to find like unique exercises that had value and found my way to these Indian clubs and just doing these heart swings. It just showed me you know, how, how many, uh, how many parts are involved, uh, in, in an actual rotation with your wrist, your elbows, your shoulders, what your shoulder was more capable of. Uh, and so, you know, to kind of break it down, I started working on the mobility aspect of it and regaining that rotation and then started to load that with Indian clubs. So one at a time, you know, they have that nice, like sort of long lever to it. So it adds, uh, you know, that, uh, that, that weight sort of on the outside of this rotation, uh, which you feel, you know, all your stabilizer muscles get involved. You feel, uh, you know, this stimulus that, uh, you're actually, it's, it's a struggle. It's an acceleration, a deceleration. So you have to be able to, uh, have strength in slowing it down, speeding it up, 
Uh, and then you can you can go from there with a heavier weight and work your way up to a mace bell where you're in a position where man, it, you know I'm swinging something substantially heavy, uh, and I I, sh I have to have perfect mobility and strength, you know, in this rotation, uh, in order to you know not hurt myself for one, but also. Uh, that's something that's going to keep sort of bulletproofing my shoulder when I go to then press. I was just going to say that I don't think there is a single way to bulletproof your shoulders better than that. I mean, when you think about everything that you're saying, you know, like accelerate, decelerate the weight, control it through full range of motion, forwards and backwards, and all the muscles that are involved, you're developing everything that's around that that shoulder. I don't think there is a better way for you to protect yourself for like overall health. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of people see that and they think, oh, strong man stuff, or they just think, oh, that's not for me. I don't really identify with people that train this unconventional way, but I adopted it for that reason. I mean, you're the one that also got me involved in that. And I remember like breaking it down that way going, dude, this is, if there's one thing I don't stop ever doing for my shoulder, it's that. Like mm -hmm. if I had to choose one thing for a client to do forever. Just keep your shoulders healthy. Yeah. If you yeah. did mace bell swings forever and you could do those really good and you did no other shoulder work, I guarantee you would have healthy, strong shoulders for the rest of your life. That one thing, not, and, and I, I can't say the Sets same. your posture. Yeah, you know, I can't say the position. same for even like an overhead press, which is what we're talking about today, which is by far the one of the best exercises you can do for overall. Well, it's and a bit one-dimensional in comparison. Exa it? It's very one-dimensional yeah. in comparison to those. So I think it's something that you everybody should incorporate into their routine, whether you do it with mace or Indian clubs. I just think it's for overall health, it's one of the best things yeah. you could do for your shoulders. By the shoulders. way, if you don't have, a mace uh, or you know Indian clubs. I recommend you get them, but you could also do like halos with uh, a, yep. a plate or a dumbbell where you're starting from your body, a kettlebell, yeah, or a kettlebell, and you go around. I mean, that'll do some of that as yeah. well. I don't think people realize just how complex the shoulder joint is. Right, it's it's one of the more interesting joints. It is, the hips and it and are the, the most well, most well, dynamic. Even besides that, even like in the hip, you have your femur in the hip, and that's kind of it. And there's some involvement there with shoulders. Like floating with the SI joint and all that stuff, but with the shoulder, you have the humor, and then you have the scapula. If if you extend your arm above your head without moving your scapula, you're not going to go very far, right? If you try to throw something without involving your scapula, you're not moving That's at a good all. Point. In mm -hmm. fact, when people have frozen shoulder, if you've ever heard of frozen shoulder, it, it's because those two parts of the joint are not communicating, and one of them isn't moving properly. These rotational movements really keep those two parts communicating properly. And they have to because that's how the shoulder joint works. This is why this is one of the reasons why humans can throw with incredible accuracy. It's one of the reasons why we were one of the apex predators. We had these really interesting shoulder joints that allowed us to do these kind of full range of motion, accurate, you know, fast movement. And so rotational movements allow that. But yeah, halos are, again, if you don't have that equipment, halos with a kettlebell or a plate uh, will simulate this to some extent and give you some of that value. Now, the next point is something that I did for bodybuilding reasons, and I had no idea mm -hmm. that it would contribute to my overhead press, which was rear delt exercises. Now, for those of you into body sculpting and bodybuilding, you probably do rear delt ex exercises because you probably have realized by now that having well-developed mm -hmm. rear delts gives you really round, nice-looking shoulders. But yeah. athletes and people interested in strength oftentimes neglect rear delt exercises because they think why i'm you know I, overhead pressing okay i'm just going to practice that i don't really need my my rear delts to be developed not true yep. the rear delt plays a very special role in stabilizing your shoulder especially at the top of the movement so besides making you look better you got to develop the shoulder in its entirety otherwise you're going to miss out on its full capacity for strength well that's a great point i mean to 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 kind of put it back in terms of like uh, an athlete like i didn't consider these quite as much. And I remember like talking with Adam about this um, as he was trying to develop his shoulders, you know, to get on stage. And I was working that I realized like, wow, this just puts me in a, such a better position posturally uh, too. That's it, it's addressing. Cause I'm, I'm so forward. I'm so much in that, you know, sagittal 
plane and everything it, it all always loaded in front of me uh, i'm not really like paying attention or putting emphasis on on you know these muscles that are supporting uh that to to happen and keep everything tracking well mm-hmm. and so just getting strong there helped to kind of you know pull pull it back so uh you know the potential for me to get that pain again uh really decreased substantially well i lo- i love that point show me a person with great rear delts that doesn't have pretty good upper body posture mm. you just it's it i that was one of my favorite things about it. of course i was doing it for aesthetic reasons with competing and stuff but like you justin one of the things i noticed was man as i started to develop those it just helped keep me in good posture i just think it's neglected and it's it's very obvious too when somebody goes to do them uh, that you're just not used to working because mo- many people can't uh, hit them mm-hmm. because the, the, it's this mo- this movement like a reverse fly and the upper back ends up taking over a lot of the movement and the rear delts don't carry much of the load at all. And I just think that learning how to do that is just, it's so important aside from aesthetics, building the shoulder head press, but overall posture, I think it's it's for sure something you got to do. Yeah, you know what I noticed as a kid was there was one athlete, in one type of athlete in particular that always had incredibly developed shoulders and in particular incredibly incredibly developed rear delts and when i say the sport and i know you're going to think about those athletes you're going to see this particular muscle development and at first it doesn't make sense but when you really think about it, it does boxers if you ever watch boxers and they're boxing they always have these really well developed shoulders and especially the rear delt and you think what does the rear delt have to do with throwing a punch it has a lot to do with throwing a punch <laughs> decelerating mm-hmm. that punch, stabilizing the punch, being able to throw from different angles. Um, that rear delt is very important in shoulder stability, movement, mobility, and explosive power. So if you're like a if you're a power and a strength person and you never think about developing aesthetics and you've neglected uh, rear delt work, you're missing out. Do some of it and watch what happens to your overhead press strength. Now the next one is uh, something that's very important. We talk about this all the time. It's just Working on overall mobility. Here's a here's one mobility movement that is easy that I think a lot of people can benefit from, and those two reasons are why it's one of my favorites. Just your it's just your good old fashioned uh, shoulder dislocates. Mm-hmm. Very basic shoulder mobility movement. Pretty easy for most people to figure out how to do. Not that they can do it, but rather there's less skill involved, so they can practice it, move within their range of motion, and slowly develop that full range of motion. But it does move the shoulder through a lot of its potential involving not just the humerus moving in the shoulder, but also the scapula. And that's what makes it kind of an important movement. My first time doing it, I did it and I remember feeling really weird doing it. Within three or four sessions of practicing it, I had already greatly improved my shoulder mobility. Yeah. And you see a lot of uh, people miss... um misperforming this exercise and lots of uh, arched backs to kind of I think that's the reason why I don't like it is because of how many people I think do it wrong. They think they're doing it right, but then they're they're cheating the movement. Yeah, if you you really have to maintain firm, good posture, like an upright position. Uh, and then also, like I see a lot of elbows bending and breaking, uh, you know, to be able to get it further. And so um, to be able to grab it as wide as possible first and then I, I usually coach and have work on the grip in terms of sort of pulling outward to get more tension there uh, and, and maintain your posture, you know, really emphasize that core to keep everything in good alignment as you're now flipping it back overhead. And really just from there, you have to figure out whether or not you can keep proceeding uh, because if you have to break in terms of bending your elbow or moving and yeah. arching your back, yeah, stop or, right there. You stop. That's mm-hmm. then, then it's nil at that point. I, I, for me, my favorite to teach is the zone one, the zone yep. one test. I just, for the average person, um, the feedback of the wall is what is, is so different than all those other movements is that they have something that can tell them like, oh, their forms are perfect. It's really hard. Like somebody who looks at one of you guys doing a, like a shoulder dislocate or even like a wall circle. And then they I start throwing the thing. Yeah. Right? Then they just kind of do it and they think they're doing it correctly. And they don't have any really good feedback unless they have a coach or a trainer. They're telling them what's going on. Whereas I could take somebody who is a brand new or relatively new client, put them on the zone one and 
point out like we do in the prime test. These are all the points of contact you need to fill this and they can feel that themselves. They know right away if they start to slide up that wall, the head comes forward or their back arches up off the wall or their hands come off the wall. Like they'll see that and feel that right away because of the feedback mm -hmm. of the wall. So practicing the zone one test and getting good. And it, it I mean, it's emulating exactly where you want to be in an overhead press. So I think practicing that for mobility is like one of the best things that it encourages can do. tension, right? It encourages yeah. that you stay connected if, if you do it right to all those moving parts. So I, I agree. I think that's another one. Another one would be handcuffs with rotation, yeah. which is another going to, by the way, with mobility work, it's not just going through the motion. You have to be connected to the whole movement. That's what's really yeah. important because you could have somebody that's loosey goosey in their shoulders and you know what they would call hypermobile, but with really low tension and they could do shoulder dislocates, uh, no problem just by swinging it back yeah. and forth. But if you get that person to create tension and do it yeah. slowly, slow down, create more struggle in it. That's it. Now you're making the exercise really valuable. All right. This last one is, uh, extremely important. And I want to explain why here for a second. I, th it's extremely important that you have a very strong and stable core when you're trying to overhead press uh, your body weight. So here's why, right? The, the, the thing that you're trying to protect the most when you're doing an overhead press, at least in relation to the core, is your spine. And your spine, if you look at your spine and you take it out of your body, I mean, it, it can move in almost any direction. It's made up of, of a bunch of joints, but it's surrounded by all this muscle. If some part of that muscle in the core is weak or not doing what it's supposed to, the other muscles start to take over. And oftentimes, and you talked about this earlier in the episode, Adam, oftentimes what people have is a weak abdominal, oblique, transverse abdominal area, which means that their lower back has to compensate. And so you get this overarching in the back and tightening in order to create stability. And then what happens is the spine moves to some of its end range of motion. You start to rely on the joints of the spine and then you load it and now you're asking for a lower back injury. Now you're asking for, you know, a disc to get slipped or impinged because you're not able to stabilize with a strong core. So how do we work on this? Well, you want to strengthen all those muscles I talked about properly, your abs, your obliques, your TVA. You want to do those overhead carries that we talked about helps you stabilize that core. If you have a state, by the way, for those of you listening who are like, what do you mean strong core? I can overhead press a lot. I tell you what. Put on a weight belt, go overhead press again. Wow, magical. You could press 15 more pounds overhead. Mm -hmm. What do you think just happened? That belt didn't lift the weight up for you. All it did was increase your core stability. All of a sudden, you could lift more weight. Why not strengthen your core naturally so that you could do that on your own? You could mm -hmm. probably make the case that strengthening the core is uh, most valuable for the overhead press than almost any other movement. I'm, as you're talking right now, I'm kind of thinking about, I'm like, what else could I think of that having a, a strong core contributes to everything, but I mean, like really contribute to that movement more than any other movement. Yeah, it's usually I, the limiting factor. Yeah, I, w I would make the case for that, not only for the, the top of the movement, because you've got this extended lever, but even the beginning when you initiate, you know, think of like a sprinter who's getting ready to take off and run. They they put their feet in those running blocks and they explode out of there. A hundred percent. And now imagine that same sprinter doing it with no blocks and they're on that loose dirt. What happens? It would lose so much of their takeoff and power the same way that you would if you have a really weak core when you take off from that press the first thing that initiates before anything moves is that core and if that's unstable you're going to lose so much ground just trying to get it up oh, off your chest have you guys ever seen really like cars with super high horsepower take off and then they twist yeah you ever seen that yeah where the, the frame literally twists, and if it's not stable enough, that power's gone. That car's not going anywhere. It'll snap. And you've got a, a frame now that's bent. The reason why that's happening is the engine is generating all this force. The car wasn't stable enough or strong enough to withstand that twist. So although the tires went to generate force, the car wasn't able to translate it because it wasn't stable enough. That's what happens with your core. You generate force from the ground. You press a weight overhead. Uh-oh, core can't stabilize. Doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter how strong your shoulders are. If your core can't stabilize it, you can't lift the weight. It's not happening. Or worse, you end up hurting yourself. So a very, very strong, stable core is very important. In fact, if you look at some of the best athletes, forget strength athletes for a second. So let's imagine if we took all strength athletes out of this category and just considered other athletes that exhibit 
incredible upper upper you know overhead stability right think of like uh ice skaters right when the when the guy lifts up the the girl and he's skating a, across the rink or whatever super stable gymnasts right when they're holding people uh, above overhead they're lifting their partner which is you know I don't know 120 pounds 100 maybe at the most not very heavy but how are they able to do all those movements and stabilize them their core is incredibly stable it's like their whole I remember going to a Cirque du Soleil show and watching some of these people hold each other up above their head and I remember think I was the shoulder strength was cool I was like man their shoulders were holy cow their their core is so stable it's like an iron rod mm -hmm. like nothing is bending them in half and that's why they're able to hold each other up with so with well, you, know, you don't grace. realize how yeah. much energy and strength you lose when you don't because it has to be distributed to all these other muscles <laughs> totally to, yeah when that's like where you're really going to notice is when you start getting three four five six ten reps you, when you have that stable core, all those other muscles aren't having to kick in to help try and get it up over your head and to overcompensate versus having that stable core. You'll see your strength go up just from that alone. Right? Totally. So I like counter rotation exercises for this. Uh, planks done properly mm -hmm. can be pretty good for stuff like this. Overhead carries. And then your direct work, right? So your ab work and your oblique work, rotational work is really good for this kind of stuff. You do that. And oftentimes, I've seen this with a lot of clients. All we do is get the core stronger and then their overhead press uh, strength, you know, tends to go up. So there you have it. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of our free guides. We have guides that can help you with almost every fitness goal and they're totally free. Again, it's mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So Justin is at mindpumpjustin. I'm at mindpumpsalon. Adam is at mindpumpadam.